but it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and uh, hopefully we'll have a very uh, positive and enriching discussion about uh, the debate of Islamic norms in the Arab countries. And uh, I think for many of us who are observing and watching what is occurring in the Arab world uh, today and the Muslim world, uh, on a personal level, I say it's about time. Right? On a more uh, real deeper level, it's been in the making for uh, quite some time. And uh, the debates are beginning. They're a very rich debate in Egypt, in Tunisia, in uh, Yemen, in Syria, in Jordan, uh, in Bahrain, which tends to be left off the uh, uh, map. Uh, but uh, we are seeing transformation, and possibly one of those transformations that we are witnessing uh, is the place of Islam, and in particular the place of Islamic uh, groups uh, and uh, organizations that are attempting to engage in uh, the political process and enter into uh, what we could broadly say the civil society. Uh, it definitely will be a highly contested uh, space. Uh, and we will see what will be the outcome uh, in the near future. Uh, so hopefully in this session we'll have some discussion. I know that we'll have one paper, uh, but uh, we have uh, both uh, Charles, and uh, I'll chime in as much as possible, but we'll leave it both to Charles and uh, Enrique Klaus to really uh, have uh, the floor for discussion. And then we have many in here around the table that I know and see personally and I, I recognize that they will be able to uh, come in and engage in the discussion. So I'll uh, turn to Enrique and give him the floor to speak about scandals in Egypt and the manufacturing of religious norms in the public spheres. And then uh, I'll introduce Charles to respond uh, to the paper. So, okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, Berkeley University and the uh, European Institute in France, and especially uh, Professor Olivier Roy. It's off. So I thank them for uh, the invitation, and also I thank uh, Hedy Riz for the organization, and I'm particularly thankful that my uh, presentation was scheduled in the morning because it's about dinner time where I live. So being jet-lagged, I will try to give my presentation. Uh, I would like to start by uh, recalling a simple fact, but which needs to be recalled, I think, that norms, whether religious or else, do not uh, stand magically as such in the public sphere. Um, uh, and to put it quite bluntly, we do not leave with a cluster of norms uh, above our heads that we would uh, choose or pick one or, no, or another according to our uh, specific needs uh, as a kind of reservoir in which we could uh, um, well, pick up a norm or another. In the everyday world, which is the world that social scientists must be interested in, um, norms only achieve re rele relevancy uh, as they are embedded in actual contexts of uh, instantiation, so to say, or actual context of enunciation. Um, in the public sphere, this uh, context, context are, um, can be alternatively scandals, debates, or uh, controversies, among other moral categorization of the public sphere, or what we could also term generically as uh, public events or um, media events. In this respect, one could say that the manufacturing of religious norms uh, does not pre-exist its own context of uh, enunciations. And two consequences can be drawn from this fact. First, that the very definition of norms uh, is not set forever as such. It is constant, constantly uh, negotiated and renegotiated in uh, the unfolding of uh, a public event, and second, and correlatively, uh, norms and their manufacturing uh, are contingent upon the, uh, the unfolding of public events, such as scandals or controversies. Therefore, this implies that norms cannot be analyzed by social scientists away from their actual uh, context of instantiation. 
In other words, if one wants to tackle with the, the problematic of uh, normativity within the, pub the public sphere, uh, what should be sought after should be the practical conditions of the production of norms and therefore the practicalities of media events such as scandals or controversies. In this regard, I would like to dedicate my presentation to, um, to introduce some aspects of what we could call an, a praxeological approach of media events or an ethnomethodological approach of um, scandals especially. And I will address two main points. The first one uh, will consist in uh, exposing some of the difficulties encountered in formal uh, social sciences when tackling with the question of scandals. And the second point will be to set forward some elementary features of the uh, alternative uh, analysis I propose to eventually consider how uh, it might help us consider, understand uh, how religious norms actually pop up in the public sphere as they have been increasingly, increasingly doing uh, these last years. So in order to, uh, to do so, um, I will expose a few practical um, variables, not of the whole unfolding of a scandal, but at least its birth and its uh, consolidation by relying upon uh, um, a research that I have led in Egypt uh, which concerned scandals in the political life under the rule of Hosni Mubarak, which I didn't know would be his last years of reign. But before coming to this, let's start with the first point and let's address the, ma the main problem raised by uh, scandals when social scientists want to take a hold of them. And there are mainly three uh, difficulties which I would like to uh, address here. First, if you have a look at um, different works uh, led, um, I mean, dedicated to, uh, to, scan to scandals, such as uh, John B. Thompson's, or so-called scandalogists, uh, Markowitz and Serge Stein, or in France, Damien Deblique and uh, Cyril Lemieux, you will, you will find out that they all ground their definition in the Latin origin and etymology of the word scandal, scandalon, and in its use in, uh, in the Bible, under the meaning of a uh, stumbling block or stum stumbling stone, in Pierre d'Achoppement for French speakers. Apart from the aesthetical uh, considerations, this definition is of absolutely no use. Not that much because I am concerned with the uh, with scandals in an Arabic-speaking uh, society, uh, which population is dominantly Muslim, but it's simply that people don't have these references in mind when they use the word scandal. And even if there are Quran uh, verses using the word fadiha or scandal, uh, people don't have this in, in mind when they uh, use the word in the everyday, everyday world. Sorry. Mm. So we have to, um, better than, than grounding this uh, definition of the scandal in etymology, we have to rely upon or to uh, acknowledge the sovereignty of uh, ordinary people uh, in the qualification of the situations in which they take part by relying on what we could call a spontaneous or um, endogenous uh, definition of the scandal. Now, second, second difficulty in formal social sciences, many works try to analyze the scandal uh, by cons considering it whether from its causes or its social, political, electoral consequences. And in such a way that the, the process of the scandal itself is, becomes what Garfinkel would call the missing what. As a result, we are really lacking of works uh, considering the scandal as such, that is, as a practical accomplishment. Now, third, third difficulty, the few works preoccupied 
by the scandal process, actually preoccupied by, by the scandal process, usually impose to it a, um, an unfolding structure uh, previous to any analysis. Most of the time, this structure is inspired by the drama, the drama structure, and it consists in four phases. phases. The pre-scandal phase, uh, the scandal in itself, the culmination, and the aftermath. Now, such an attitude presents three problems for the analysis. The first one is that it amounts to uh, explaining a phenomena by another, that is, explaining the scandal by a, the drama production. Second, it reduces the unfolding of scandal to some mere causal uh, concatenations, and it imposes a teleological uh, reasoning to its analysis. And finally, as a result of all this, it blurs the very, um, the very foundations of the intelligibility of the scandal, uh, or of the phenomena we are supposed to analyze. Now, the fact is that each scandal has its own unfolding trajectory. To take an American example, think of the par paradigmatic uh, Watergate and compare its unfolding to the Iran Contra scandal, and you will find out that both of them have very different uh, unfolding trajectory. Now, this trajectory does not pre exist the scandal but it emerged contingently in the midst of the sequential uh, interactions which are constitutive of this type of media phenomenon. Now, this is what I've been trying to do in my research on scandals in Egypt, and it consisted in, <clears throat> it consisted in the detailed analysis of the unfolding of three cases of scandal, which occurred in 2005-2006, the first two cases can be categorized as sexual scandals, as they respectively <coughs> dealt with the, the question of pedophilia and sexual harassment in, in Egypt, while the third one uh, addressed the question of the Islamic uh, headscarf. Now, for the limited purposes of this presentation, I will only uh, speak of the later case, but I have to stress the fact that the conclusions to which I have reached, at which I have reached, are um, uh, drawn from the reproducibility of uh, the um, empirical observation in all three cases. Now, as we have started to move on to the second point I want to address, let me give you a few uh, or some elements of context uh, about this Egyptian headscarf uh, scandal. Uh, before raising a few points about the birth and the consolidation sorry, of this scandal. Uh, the headscarf scandal broke out in November 2006 after the publication of declarations allegedly held by then Minister of Culture Farouk Hosni, in which he considered the headscarf as a mark of backwardness uh, in the Egyptian society. A wide polemic ensued uh, the publication of these declarations, the apex, of which, the apex of which was a discussion in Parliament, and well, the scandal lasted for nearly a month before dying out. Now, this scandal did not break out in a vacuum, as it followed a month of intense uh, polemic about uh, the possibility for female students in Cairo University dorms to wear the integral veil, the niqab or uh, burqa. Um, not to mention other debates abroad that I will uh, briefly consider in conclusion. It is also worthy to note that the declarations were uh, held or published uh, only four days before the reopening of the Egyptian parliament following the 2005 elections in which uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, won a uh, historical record of 88 seats out of 454. Now, in this context, the, the, the media and the press were the only arena within the public sphere where uh, the debate could be held on the topic, at least during the 
first four days in the unfolding of the scandal. Interestingly, the beginning of the scandal did not match with the publication of Farouk Hosni's uh, declaration, as the El Masr al the, the, the newspaper which published uh, these declarations, did not seem to give them major importance in the first place, as they did not straight away hit the banner headline, and uh, it was published and it was inserted in, in the inside pages at the very bottom of the home news uh, page. It is only in the light of the reactions uh, that followed the publication of the declaration that their newsworthiness was upgraded. In other words, if the article triggered the scandal, this letter effectively began after the first denunciations was made, the first denunciation was made public. This first article is what we could call a trigger narrative for the scandal. And as this element has been observed in the um, analysis of the two other cases, uh, one can say that a scandal does not come out of the blue. It's, uh, it has to ground on something public, something we, we could call a master document towards which the participants will orient themselves uh, to take part in the scandal. Um, coming back to the starting point of the scandal, the very first reaction or the very first act of denunciation uh, came from the spokesperson of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Hamdi Hassan. Uh, he's a spokesperson in the Egyptian uh, parliament. Formally, his uh, reaction was a uh, procedural demand of communication, Bayan Agil, which uh, leaked into the press and paved the way for the discussion in, um, in Parliament. Now, beyond the fact that this first reaction immediately gave to the scandal an institutional uh, dimension, and thus boosting its constitution, what is interesting about it for us is that it did not address directly uh, the question of the headscarf as a religious norm, uh, nor its infringement. If it did, it only did so through indirectly through the disqualification of the person of the Minister of Culture, Farah Hosni, through what Garfinkel calls a ceremony of degradation status. Now, it is stri striking to note that all the three cases that I've been studying begin with such a ceremony of degradation status, defined as a, a quote, a communicative work between individuals whereby the, I the public identity of an actor is transformed into something else considered as inferior on the local scale of um, social types. In other words, it's a work of uh, qualification and disqualification, uh, relying upon a rhetoric of irony and uh, biographical uh, re-examination. Now, uh, it would take too much time to expose the eight conditions of the successfulness of this kind of uh, ceremony and how they are actualized in uh, Hamdi Hassan's demand of communication. But what is important to note is that this letter takes defense of what he holds as a religious norms, that is, the headscarf, not positively, but only by way of disqualifying the denounced person on a personal level. This was even more striking as the topic was discussed under the dome of the parliament after the scandal was consolidated in its early stages of uh, unfolding in the media. If the debate was very heated, it is worth it to note that both the majority, and Mubarak's uh, party, both the majority and the opposition, whether it be the religious opposition or the tiny secular uh, opposition, condemned Farah Hosni for uh, his declarations. In fact, the only cleavage uh, which emerged concerned uh, the question of whether, this question, whether these declarations were uh, held as personal statements or whether it reflected a more general tendency on behalf of the regime. In fact, in unanimity, the uh, members of parliament refused 
totally to discuss the question of the headscarf as such, as they considered, they considered it as intangible, uh, an intangible religious uh, prescription. As a whole, it appears that the, the MPs, as well as the journalists, uh, showed what Jean-Noël Ferrier calls a negative solidarity on the subject of the headscarf. That is, a solid solidarity that does not result of uh, a, a convergence of, uh, of views on the topic, but from the difficulty to show uh, public um, discourse, discord uh, regarding uh, this uh, question, the question of the headscarf. Eventually, this institutional sequence did not mark the end of the polemic, as it lasted for nearly a whole month, as I said. It was only after a long postponing institutional reconciliation between the Minister of Culture and a group of MPs that the scandal came to an end, and also as it entered within the public sphere, it entered in competition with other emerging topics uh, in the news, um, both in Egypt and in the region. Now, to conclude, there are two uh, points I would like to make to index some intertextuality with other uh, contributions in this conference, dealing with other contexts. Uh, first, as I have mentioned previously, the, the, scandal, the scandal did not break in a vacuum, and it, 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 it was preceded by other deba debates, uh, both in Egypt and abroad. Indeed, it broke out only two years after the promulgation of the French law on the headscarf, um, banning the headscarf in public spaces, uh, places, and a month after Jack Straw's uh, declarations concerning the niqab in uh, Britain. <coughs> in this respect, there is a clear uh, convergence of international debates concerning religious norms, as what, as what was uh, suggested in the, the, argu the conference argument argumentative note. But the, re the recasting of these debates uh, in the Egyptian public sphere was slightly different from uh, what was at stake in the secular context of France in, in multicultural England. On the one hand, in opposition with French, the French and the English cases, uh, in Egypt there was a political force in Parliament which was able to take position in favor of the headscarf. We didn't have that in France or in England. On the other hand, um, and even though it is slightly different, uh, I mean, it was in slightly different terms in Egypt, what seemed to be at stake in all cases was, as uh, Professor Olivier Roy said, was national identity. Even in Egypt, is the headscarf part of our national identity or not? And in France, is uh, secularism part of our identity? Now, before ending, and I would like to have a quick word on the Egyptian public sphere after what Egyptians, Egyptians called the 25th of January revolution. As uh, Professor Olivier Roy early mentioned in different articles, in opposition with the main paradigm of political sciences in the region, this revolution was essentially non-religious in nature. However, in the aftermath of this revolution, a counter-revolution has been threatening and is still threatening uh, the achievement of the revolution. And it's relying on two uh, things, in Egypt at least. The first is um, sectarian conflicts or tensions between Copts and uh, Muslims. And the second one is a kind of updating of old uh, debates concerning religious norms in specific specifically concerning the headscarf, whether it be on television, on public television, uh, in the uh, university dorms, or during uh, exams at university also. In some ways, this tends to prove that what was difficult to document uh, before the toppling of uh, Mubarak's uh, rule, that the regime um, massively resorted to such meanings as public debates and scandals about religious norms in order to factualize or to put some flesh 
on uh, the uh, Islamist threat uh, which allowed the maintaining of his uh, authoritarian regime for 30 years. And to conclude on a positive note, and, but without risking any prospective analysis on Egypt, uh, let's hope that the toppling of Mubarak's rule will put an end to this kind of misuse we can dream, but this kind of misuse is of religious norms in the Egyptian public sphere. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Professor Charles Hershkin uh, from Anthropology Department here at UC Berkeley and uh, most recently appointed to chair the Religious Studies Program. We don't have a Religious Studies Department, but we have a program, so we're looking for exciting new initiatives to come uh, forth from uh, this coming year. Thank you, Hatim. Enrique, thank you for that very thoughtful, interesting paper. Um, I should say I had, this is the first time I've heard this and did not get a chance to read it beforehand. So I'm just, we'll make a few uh, comments and then hopefully collectively we can forge a kind of um, discussion about it. Um, One of the things I was thinking of whenever the question of religious norms in the public sphere comes up, and I'm th in thinking about the context of Egypt, is Tocqueville's old remark about the United States in the 19th century, you know, when he says, when he comes to the U.S. and says, well, that, uh, that in some sense um, there's a kind of Christian morality that reigns so supreme and that so shapes the kind of uh, shape of the debates within the public arena. The public arena is left relatively free of of uh, religion, because religion is the unspoken background which shapes the sort of, the moral framework of the participants in such a, a strong way. So it seems to me one question of the public sphere could come out of that way, the way in which, for example, public dis thinking about public the public sphere as a space of discursive interaction, to what extent do we see that a certain kind of uh, religious traditions shape the protocols of discourse, uh, styles of argument, the kind of issues, the, the boundaries of what's considered relevant and irrelevant and so on. Now, I know you don't address that directly, but I'm just trying to sort of lay on the table what might be approaches to the question of religious norms in the public sphere. And there where the question is thinking about the public sphere as, let's say in a slightly more Habermasian vein, right, as a space in which a kind of critical discourse unfolds and what are the, what are the uh, discursive protocols that shape the way that shape the boundaries of that discourse and what is relevant and irrelevant and, and what kind of arguments carry weight and don't and so on. Um, now, I think you're quite right in the end when you say that the Mubarak regime instrumentally both used and to some extent manufactured or exploited scandals as a means of uh, furthering its own politics and perhaps demonizing or identifying certain dangers in society. I think that's that's uh, a correct assessment. I mean, the questions that come up for me are um, when you talk about uh, religious norms entering the public sphere, wh one question would be is, are you suggesting that there's a certain kind of, um, let's call it a style of religiosity or, or even let's just call it religious norms for which the public sphere is a, um, the cauldron within which they are produced and within which um, certain norms acquire force in society. That is, and then you could think, therefore, the institutions of public life and particularly the media that you're talking about, you'd be focusing on the way in which a, uh, those institutions mediate and, and, force and determine to some extent what comes to be taken and lived as public norms. Um, and I don't know if you were saying that in some sense, because in one way, if I think of the United States, let's say there's a debate about a crash in public or something. Uh, the question, are we speaking about religious norms in the public sphere there, or are we simply speaking about, uh, let's say, the uh, appropriate space of religion within, of religious uh, symbols within a secular society? 
And therefore the arguments themselves are not necessarily religious or based in religious norms, we might say, but are actually uh, right, are, are understood through the lens of a kind of commitment to secularity and what are, the, what are the proper boundaries authorized by that secularity and so on. See what I mean? So that would be in some way not the sort of force of a religious norm in shaping public debate, but a debate about, let's say, within a secular framework of what's the place of religion and the proper place for it and so on. I know I'm raising a set of questions that are somewhat around and tangential, tangential to your paper, but I think if we're going to debate more largely the question about uh, religious norms in the public sphere, that's one thing. The other thing, you emphasize at the beginning how important scandal and controversy is for the question of religious norms. Now, when I think about religious norms, right, I'm thinking about practices and about um, those practices that have a kind of social institutional depth such that they, right, have a, a, the, their normative force is grounded in their, their being embedded and embodied as, so they're not sort of something that are produced they're not dependent, let's say, on their in invocation in moments of scandal, let's say, in a kind of media debates, but they in some way provide a kind of, uh, right, a sort of normative background within which such debates emerge. So I'm just saying the whole question about the embeddedness of certain practices, religious, pra let's say, practices indebted to uh, religious traditions, seems to be it seems to be necessary to address that if we're going to speak about religious norms in the public sphere. Things that are not simply transparent to discourse, simply that are not put into, not simply uh, uh, debated discursively, but actually shape the, the forms of debate and so on. And that would be, would be speaking about, therefore, the pervasive force of certain norm that we might call religious in shaping public and political life. Um, all of these things we should talk about together more broadly. I think, um, let me say something about your, your comment about the revolution. That's something I've been thinking about too. And, and that is when you call it non-religious and so on. I think, uh, I think you're right that that's a, a good way to characterize it. But I'd also want to characterize it as non-secular as well in ways. And I don't know, perhaps we can talk about that. But it, what was striking to me is how little the dichotomy between secular and religious, what little role it played in shaping the forms of interaction and discourse and even commentary on the events. Um, take, for example, the collective scenes of collective prayer that are so uh, commonly viewed in Tahrir. Now, I've heard very few people comment on that as evidence of the force of religious norms in shaping. And yet any other time we see large bodies in collective prayer particularly in context of political action, we'd be very worried about the instrumental use of religion for political ends and how there's a kind of blurring of boundaries and so on. So it was interesting that those scenes, neither have I heard from Egyptians there nor have I heard from people outside, did not provoke that kind of response of, aha, my God, what's going on here? There's, in this, in this uh, excellent democratic unfolding, there's the danger of a certain kind of religious practices are being inserted into it, and are, uh, um, and it's it's curious that that worry did not. I'm sure a few people were worried, but it's it's curious how uh, little comment was made of that, and it struck me that overall the whole question about, you know, if we think of that dichotomy as a kind of a kind of a part of a political rationale that questions the secularity or religiosity as a right of practices a, a certain kind of interrogation that is uh, you know essential let's say to uh, the reasoning of modern states when they right and it's embedded in law a certain question about whether it's what's the proper domain of the religious versus the secular and so on those practices the, the whole question seemed to be absent it wasn't that that was a religious practice, nor was it a secular practice. It was the practice of the collective there, a collective whose actions were not being determined or were not uh, being framed or described through the lens offered by those twin categories. Now, those categories in Egypt, as you know, have so powerfully schematized political life for years, right? I mean, throughout the world. But if you think in Egypt, the power of... Uh, 
distinctions between is that a secular or is that a religious argument? Is that party secular or are they religious? Is that a, a violation of certain kind of religious, secular commitments to the state and so on? All of those questions have shaped and limited political life in, in powerful ways in Egypt for years. And now, as you're saying now, it's happening very forcefully, right? This whole, whole sort of invocation of religious norms and so on. But in that moment, it struck me, it was completely absent. That whole, I mean, I'm sure there'll be exceptions we can point to, but in some way, what was striking about it was that a certain kind of, uh, uh, right, a certain kind of democratic exercise was being elaborated outside the rationale authorized by that binary, which is a very interesting, it seems to me, in thinking about um, possibilities uh, outside of the tyranny of those categories. Um, so I'll just open this up, and, and, and Olivia, I think, also was going to make a few comments. So, so the, uh, the scandals you referred to uh, are part, you know, of uh, um, were part of um, constant debate, but polemical debate, you know, during the time of the dictatorships on religious norms. You know. Uh, uh, and in fact, when the political space was closed, uh, uh, this uh, so-called religious space, but I agree it's also a political space, it's not too sorry, but uh, uh, in a sense, a debate on religious norms were possible, uh, while uh, 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 truly political debates were not possible. So uh, uh, this uh, debate, this polemics, on uh, uh, scandals played a big role, uh, not only in Egypt, but Egypt is a very uh, interesting case. So you have uh, uh, the story you mentioned, you had also the uh, Hizbah story uh, with uh, uh, Nasr Abu Zaid, the uh, cancellation of the, uh, uh, his marriage, uh, the fact that uh, actors were able to challenge you know, uh, uh, the political order by pushing for religious norms that uh, which a state cannot ignore, you know. Uh, but of course, uh, pushing these religious norms had a tremendous uh, uh, political impact on uh, uh, the relationship between states and, and society and on the legitimacy of the state. So it was a way to challenge also the legitimacy of uh, 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 the regime. Uh, the apostasy uh, 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 debate also played a big role uh, in that, you know, by trying, you know, by uh, forcing the state to, to uh, give up, in a sense, uh, its uh, uh, monopoly uh, on uh, public order and power, and uh, forcing the state to accept norms which are not uh, uh, defined by the state, not only not defined by the state because it's religious norms, but also where the, the actors are not uh, uh, actors uh, uh, of the regime, uh, so individual actors. You know. Uh, so. And it had a lot of uh, 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 destabilizing effect for, for, for the state. Um, but what happens when suddenly the political space is open? Mm -hmm. no. uh, uh, what happened uh, uh, with the actors who used to push uh, 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 for implementation of religious norms uh, independently of the context, when suddenly uh, there is at least an open space of debate uh, uh, and of freedom. Uh, uh, so. And uh, something which uh, uh, is interesting now, so my, my, uh, I'm taking the example I'm quoting not from my uh, uh, field works because I didn't go there uh, uh, since the, uh, uh, the events, but we had recently uh, uh, a workshop uh, at the Institute in Florence and uh, 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 some uh, 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 people came from a uh, uh, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and Egypt. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, most of our interlocutors were, you know, part of what we call liberal Islamists. You know, PGD in Morocco, the left of the Muslim Brothers, uh, people of the uh, 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 Nahdat in, uh, in Tunisia. And they said the same thing, you know, uh, uh, while the contexts are very different. So the mainstream so-called Islamist parties are you know, dealing with, uh, 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 well, their own uh, 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 acceptation 
of uh, 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 democracy, of uh, free elections, of uh, uh, building a political party, accepting you know, uh, 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 contestation, uh, uh, and not trying to, well, to impose an Islamic state or Sharia or uh, 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 anything. So. And, but the actors who were pushing for the Islamic norms before are still there. No. They call them Salafi. I, I don't want to debate on what Salafism is, but it's, the term is used, you know, so. And uh, the Salafi are coming say, uh, and said, oh, uh, uh, you are f uh, uh, forgetting the Islamic norms. No. For instance, uh, uh, in Egypt, a Christian governor has been appointed. It's not the first time, but a Christian governor has been appointed. So there was a demonstration no, uh, opposing, in the name of the Islamic norms, uh, the appointment of uh, a Christian gov uh, a governor. And uh, the, the Salafi are challenging you know, the uh, Islamists, the Muslim Brothers, uh, the Nahdat, and the PGD, saying, so we, are, we have a clear case here where uh, uh, we may uh, forget the norms, you know, the religious norms, uh, in the name of democracy, of citizenship, and so on. But you should not. You shouldn't. You, know. you have, uh, okay, democracy maybe is good, but uh, we should put the Islamic norms first. And according to them, of course, uh, 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 a Christian could not be appointed. So the Muslim brother had to answer in political terms, and not in theological terms. So they didn't, uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, you may know better, uh, 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 they didn't say, oh, uh, uh, Omar did that, uh, so and so, we have, uh, so and so. No, they say, well, uh, 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 there is no problem in appointing Christian governor. No. Uh, uh, same with Hanushi in uh, Tunisia. <coughs> He's not trying to find, you know, an Islamic narrative to explain why uh, uh, Nahdat is now, uh, is now, or maybe it was before, and that, uh, so. but uh, now is a, a, a democratic party pushing for citizenship. No. He's not trying to find an Islamic narrative. No. Uh, uh, but there is this uh, uh, permanent overbidding, you know, of the Salafists, uh, 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 and we, which, uh, by the way, obliged uh, the mainstream Islamic parties to say, "Okay, it's democracy, so we have to we have to refer to a different set of norms." Uh, of course, we still think that uh, Article Two, uh, the Egyptian Constitution, should be uh, kept, maintaining that Islam is uh, 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 the religion of the state, and so and so. But uh, 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 they uh, are pushed to accept the autonomy of uh, 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 democratic norms and rules of the game, uh -huh. which is interesting. Uh, 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 but even the Salafi are now you know, pushing for Islamic norms in a space which is far more open. Mm. And there is a problem. Mm. For instance, when in Egypt uh, uh, they uh, attacked uh, Sufi graves, mm. uh, uh, they had in front of them not just uh, uh, the, the answer of a religious community, but also the answer of uh, the population. See what you are doing, you know. Uh, uh, it's not time to attack uh, Sufi graves or uh, 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 Christian churches. It's from the past. Uh, uh, now we have to. Uh, 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 you are destroying, you know, uh, 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 running against uh, 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 the movement. And it's uh, 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 so we, we are here now. Uh, 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 but uh, it's also a challenge for the Salafi how to express, you know. Uh, uh, their uh, uh, will to still stick with the idea that there should be uh, religious, the, the, the religious norms, should be the norm in the public sphere, with a democratic uh, 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 open space. And uh, they are, uh, my impression is that they are very embarrassed, you know, uh, uh, because in fact, uh, uh, because they are not confronted with the police, uh, uh, they are not confronted with the regime. Uh, but they are confronted with people who want to discuss, you know, who come to them and say, let's discuss. Uh, 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 and they are not used to, to that. Uh, 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 same thing, by the way, inside the Coptic Church, you know, uh, 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 until now, the, uh, so until right. recently, uh, uh, the clergy uh, uh, succeeded, you know, in uh, uh, being the representative of the uh, Coptic community. And in fact, was quite happy to have uh, the religious affiliations 
uh, expressed in terms of identity, belonging to a community, and so on and so on. No. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the society of the clergy, the clergy is also challenged by some young Christians who say, no, citizenship and democracy. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, uh, it has a, a translation in terms of uh, religious freedom. Uh, if it's citizenship, then everybody can change. Uh, it's not an issue, you know, uh, uh, for a cop to convert to Islam or for a Muslim to convert to Christianity. But it's still an issue, uh, uh, by definition. So, uh, uh, we have, you know, an interesting uh, process of uh, 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 changing the nature of the, uh, uh, of the debate on religious norms when the uh, political space is suddenly open. You know? And here, uh, uh, I agree with what uh, Charles said, you know, it's not an issue of secularization versus uh, religion. Uh, 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 religious uh, attitude, like praying in public, doesn't have the same meaning. You know? uh, and if we compare with the Islamic revolution of Iran, you know, it's very interesting to see the difference of uh, 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 um, uh, the um, uh, exhibition, if I can say that, of religious uh, practices in the public uh, sphere. Uh, in Iran, to pray uh, in the streets was a clear sign of political protest. No. Apparently, not in Tahrir. No, no. It's okay. It's banalization, in a sense, you know, sort of normalization of religion. So it's not a process of secularization. Uh, it's a process of uh, uh, normalization of, of, of religious uh, freedom and practices, I think. And uh, uh, of course, it's too soon, you know, to, to make uh, definitive theories, although we are paid for to make theories, you know, uh, 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 to teach theories. But uh, uh, it's uh, uh, something we have uh, which might change uh, uh, or uh, uh, put uh, uh, a new. Uh, uh, new input uh, in our debate on the religious norms public sphere. I would like to open the question to questions and discussion from the rest, but if I just may add a little bit of uh, context, I think the Egyptian revolution and well as the Tunisian revolution is still a work in progress. Uh, I think the place or the presence of Islam and also Christianity is within the revolution period as well as the post revolution still have to be uh, investigated, more research has to be done. Uh, I think we could uh, speak that not all uh, organizations and groups that have attributed Islam to their identity were on the same side. I think the Salafis were decisively against the revolution, considering the statement that they issued. Uh, the uh, Sufis and the various Sufi tariqas within Egypt were against the revolution. And therefore, we have to actually research their pre-revolution position as they attempt to try to recapture some of the lost credibility by becoming more religious than they're religious, and I think there has to be some research in there, so I'm looking at that part of uh, attempting to capture lost space, and what do you do? You try to become more religious and attacking Christian uh, sites as well as Sufi sites, so I'm saying that that's still research that's to be, to be done and to be uh, followed. Uh, what I think is very clear is that and, and an analysis that tries to once again look at the binary, secular versus religious. And I think in the Egyptian context, uh, that binary was not present, but I agree with Charles that to say that it, the religion was not a part of uh, the revolution, I think you just have to focus on why was it that Friday was the largest gathering that took place on a regular basis and uh, became part and parcel of the mobilization that taking place. And therefore, uh, even today in Yemen, uh, almost four millions are out on the street on Friday, in Syria likewise. So we have to rethink about how religion plays within the larger Arab and Muslim world uh, in the following period. But once again, we are talking here in a crystal ball without having the primary research done. And many of us might be uh, demonstrated to be either wrong or don't have the facts on our ground after we actually carry out the analysis. 
I just wanted actually to maybe begin by a question. You looked at the etymology of scandal, uh, but you didn't pursue the etymology in Arabic, the concept of fadiha, right? Having fadaha yadah, fadiha as an etymon, which is actually the demarcation between public and private space in relations to uh, both the political and the religious. So how this fadiha as a concept in the public space uh, also connected to some religious norms as it relates to uh, how the society functions in relations of the attempt or constantly to hide or to veil the private space even at the higher level of political discourses. You could answer or if anybody would like to jump and... Uh, Perhaps we can ask first. Yeah. Well, let's get up as many questions as we can. Yeah. Don't forget I'm alone. Huh? huh? I'm alone. He's alone. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not alone in Berkeley. No. We'll uh, support for <laughs> you. Anyone? Questions? No? I haven't seen ah, so yes. many yes. people that are I have. Um, thank you very much for your talks. Um, I had a question for um, uh, Professor Klaus and uh, a commentary for Professor Hirschkin. Um, the question I had for you was about the, you talked about the contextual factors that are key uh, when one is to define what is scandalous, what is not, and so on. And I was, um, I heard you say a lot of things, but I did not hear you uh, talk about the um, nature of the headscarf phenomena in the Egyptian context. Um, the, what I mean by that is, for, well, having lived in Egypt for quite a bit, um, the way I see that phenomena uh, would be uh, very key to actually defining why is it that Farouk Hosni's comment, comments were scandalous in a way. That is to say that, as you probably know, the headscarf in Egypt over the past maybe 15 to 20 years has become more or less something of a very um, uh, mundane religious practice, not particularly an, an expression of, definitely not an expression of a religious, uh, political stance in, the, uh, in, in society, uh, increasingly a result of um, almost an overriding social norm. Uh, an overarching uh, um, social uh, social conformity uh, kind of uh, of phenomenon, and not particular or not always an expression of religious piety. So, given all these kind of the the uh, different connotations that the headscarf has taken, especially in urban uh, Egyptian cities. I, what you said hit me as, of course, of course his comments were going to be absurd, and of Farouk Hosni's comments, and of course there was what you call the negative consensus among the seculars, the leftists, and the Islamists alike, and in parliament, of basically not engaging in a real um, conversation about the validity of those claims, even if there was agreement about them on the part of the seculars and the leftists, simply because in such a scene in which the headscarf became what it is as a symbol in the, in the public sphere in Cairo especially, the comments were viewed as absurd, uh, even if valid for certain political inclinations. So that was my question, did you consider the, the um, headscarf in context, so to speak? because I think it, it has the very different connotations in other contexts, say Iran, for instance. Uh, for uh, Professor Hishkind, I was just uh, intrigued by the question about the, uh, the extent to which the religious norms shaped uh, public debate. And what's, what's striking me now, and this is just a comment, in the post-revolutionary time in Egypt, is that both on the, what usually we would think of as a secular liberal side, or you know, on the part of liberals who are also have been renowned to be seculars in the Egyptian scene, and on the part of the Islamists, uh, there is um, a certain um, uh, there is a certain uh, a caution from deviating from, uh, from a uh, a conception of religion as definitely shaping 
what is the uh, what we are discussing in the public sphere. So just to give an example, the liberals are more and more emphasizing that their platform, their political platforms, are not about shunning religion out of the uh, out of out of the public sphere, and, the, and not even about separating religion and politics as such, but about, and I use the exact terms they do, regulating the relationship between religion and politics, allowing religion to shape public discourse, and therefore intervene in the political process through shaping the public good, or the conception of public good and public interest, even if not a codified law. So um, when you talk about how religious norms shape public debate, that very much struck me, especially in what is conventionally known in Egypt as the secular liberal discourse. Even the secular liberals, if they want to attain any air of legitimacy in the current public debate, have to play by the rules of the game, even if on the personal level I know some of them, even if it goes against personal beliefs of political uh, heads of those parties. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation and the, and the discussion points. I just had a, a question, maybe it's more theoretical, uh, but just in terms of the work of events themselves, um, to uh, allow us to rethink certain kinds of categories, whether <clears throat> they're around what constitutes a secular or religious, um, how do local uh, practices relate to kind of global phenomena, uh, what US or European involvements are in, for one example, the revolution. Um, and because you, 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 talk, you began talking about media, and I was thinking, that you know, all of these relationships in some ways are mediated, right? I mean, our experience of the revolution, as Dr. Bazian was also saying, I mean, these are not necessarily facts on ground. I mean, they're mediated to, a, to us in certain ways. And so the question I have is, you know, what makes the Egyptian revolution more palatable to us? You know, so there's questions, Professor Mahmoud just recently gave a paper on you know, the issue of violence, nonviolence, something that's nonviolent makes it relevant because they can be democratic just like us. So it's really about them, it's their revolution, but it makes it palatable to us because we can digest this kind of nonviolent nature. But what's spectacular about all of this is the ways in which all of these categories are blurred, right? Secular and religious, uh, local, global, male, female, um, all, all of these things come together in ways that we haven't imagined. So I guess the question I have is, uh, given not just the the incredible ways in which this particular event has given rise to these kinds of questions, uh, what what do you think is happening theologically? Just at a theological level, what does it say in terms of reshaping or rethinking norms? Because as as Charles said, as Professor Professor Hirschkin said, there you know it's not just about norms entering a public sphere. The public sphere events, scandals, also create opportunities for us to rethink categories, but rethink embodied acts, right? It's not just about how we're gonna mediate something or how we're gonna talk about our identity or narrate it through discourses, but they're actual embodied acts and practices that are then reconstituted. So I guess the, the question, to put it short, is really about you know, what, do these, um, what do these events permit us to think about um, in terms of the reenactments of uh, religious identity, if we can call it that, or, uh, or the role of kind of theology in all of this. Uh, what's changed in, in terms of the, those norms? I have three pages of questions, so I will try to answer it. Some are overlapping, some are not, but... Um, well, to begin with uh, this young lady's uh, question about the contextual factors I was contextualizing for, um, for, this, um, for the purposes of my, of my speech, but um, actually I don't, well, it's, um, I think there is a question of ep epistemological uh, choices on my behalf. As I said, I, I'm working in ethnomethodology that is with a radical uh, conception of context, which is, uh, I cannot talk of context as something that's in the air. It has to be documented with 
um, I mean, as I, as, I write, as I work on written uh, parts of media, uh, I have to see in the media what's relevant within the text and not what's my own co conception of uh, the context. So I'm with you, definitely with you, after eight years living in Cairo, the, there is not one single definition of uh, the headscarf in, in Egypt. Even, I mean, you have different names for the, uh, the veil, I mean, for the same act of veiling oneself, uh, of putting a headscarf on one's head. Uh, and each one tends to have moral implication, like the hijab, uh, isned, which is with the long, uh, uh, to cover the, the, the breast, or uh, what else. We don't use burqa, burqa which is what we use in France, for instance, la burqa, which, is, I mean, in, in Egypt, it, it, it's not audible at all. You, it's the same thing. I mean, you, a woman which is not showing anything of her face except her eyes. So uh, I'm wondering about the, the moral implications that, that is behind, behind the different categorization. Why do we use burqa, burqa, in, uh, in France, whereas I'm pretty sure most of the, of the women who are viewing themselves in, in, in France use the term niqab, which is coming from the Gulf and not from uh, Afghanistan or something. Um, so that's one way of, uh, of answering this question of, of the context. Uh, well, it, it can be moral, but it's certainly a fashion uh, trend also. I mean, you can have the, the, the headscarf that it's matching with the purse or, or the shoes or stuff. I mean, it's pretty, it's fashionable, it is. Um, but uh, concerning the origin, even the origin of this scandal, uh, it was supposed to be declarations of the record on behalf of Farah Hasan. Uh, he was having, um, uh, how do you call it, a meeting with journalists, a press conference, and he saw this woman from El Ahram who used to be uh, without a uh, headscarf and happened to be wearing the headscarf on that very day. So he had a comment on that's a sign of backwardness. And some woman, a woman journalist who happens to be uh, wearing the headscarf also, uh, write it down in, um, in, uh, in an article. But in the first place, it was just, well, Farah Hasni declared that the veil is a, a, a sign of backwardness without saying that's good, that bad, that's bad, that's without any comment. That's in the aftermath when the Muslim Brotherhood, especially Hamdi Hassan, uh, took hold of this, uh, of this uh, or has a grip on these declarations that it has become a scandal. Once again, it's uh, linked with my epistemological um, choices and that I don't uh, consider that in itself it is a, a subject of scandal. It, it was just uh, some conditions of felicity that made it a scandal, I think. Now after, in linkage with this uh, question, uh, about the shaping of the public sphere with r religious norms, once again, it's pretty hard to talk about Egypt now because things hopefully are, are changing. So, But until or during Mubarak's uh, rule, there was this, uh, but I think it, it might also be the case afterwards. There is this um, uh, argumentative constraint that when someone introduces an Islamic uh, argu arg argumentative argument, arg an argument. Uh, then you, you cannot uh, you cannot um, answer to it. I mean that's something you cannot um, challenge in a way. And you have at the same time you have the obligation to answer in uh, religious terms. It doesn't work if you say well, but on behalf of the of the human rights, this is not true. No, we don't care. That's a question of truth of. Uh, uh, truth programs, as uh, Paul Vane says, each one has, each uh, religion, each ideology has its own definition of truth, and it's, there's no overlapping possible between 
uh, between different ideologies. Uh, mm -hmm. What else? Um, it, it's pretty hard to answer on the theological point of view about uh, the, can, the, how would you say that? What it contains, what the norms, the religious norms contains. Considering the latest uh, developments after the re revolution, I'm quite uh, amazed at the role of uh, Al-Azhar in, uh, in the aftermath of the revolution. Uh, as they are emerging as a kind of uh, in-between, and even the Muslim brothers are a kind of in between, have a kind of in-between role between the Salafi on one part, whatever they are, whoever they are, and, well, uh, pro-democratic people. Uh, you had this, um, uh, the, uh, the arsoning, arsoning of a church? It was in Alexandria. In, no, no, that, that was uh, before the, uh, after the, after the revolution in, uh, in uh, south of, Ky of Cairo, someone put fire in, uh, in, in a church. And then there was this sectarian tensions and Al-Azhar uh, sent a delegation there to, uh, to make some, some kind of reconciliation, sulh, uh, between, between, uh, between the people of, of, the, of the village. And it, it, usually it was the, the, N, uh, the National Democratic Party, the NDP, that was carrying this role in Qina, for instance. It happened in uh, 2007, and the NDP was making the reconciliation. Now it's Al-Azhar. And even when uh, nowadays uh, Salafi are demonstrating to, uh, to um, in the case of Camellia, I don't know if you heard of this conversion case, a young Copt or Copt, Coptic woman who has uh, converted to Islam and then she has disappeared and the people pretend that church, the church has uh, uh, kidnapped her and stuff. So now you have uh, Salafi demonstrating, it's been a month now, every Friday, they're demonstrating uh, in front of Masjid al-Nur and to ask for the, the army to show Camellia and they, they, they say we want our sister Camellia and stuff. So. Now she, she's supposed to appear publicly within the two weeks. But here again, the Muslim brothers with their new party, they, they, they emerge as a kind of moderate or in between, uh, between uh, the Salafi and people who have uh, democratic consideration. And that's striking about this morning, uh, Olivier Roy was talking about the, the, the Turkish model of uh, moderate Islamic party. Even the Muslim brothers, they, they choose, uh, well, they didn't choose the very same name, but they choose the party of liberty and uh, <coughs> and justice. So justice is here. Uh, liberty or freedom is because of tahrir, because of uh, uh, the liberation place, or I guess, so they want to stick on what happened or to, to be close to uh, the revolution, and at the same time, take the name uh, which recalls somewhat, somehow, uh, the role of um, the Turkish uh, political party. I think. Uh, where should I? Go ahead. One more. Um, well, concerning. Oh. Concerning the revolution as itself, okay, there was, I'm with you, there was this uh, scenes of, um, of collective prayer in, on Tahrir. Uh, this is part of the religious, uh, it's pretty religious, I mean, people are pretty re religious in, in, in Egypt. So, uh, well, I, I had this friend of mine who took me to, uh, to Tahrir during, during the revolution. His father is part of the Muslim brother. I used to live in Manial where the headquarters of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood was. And he, he had several members of his family from the Muslim Brothers, and he defined himself as independent. And he was praying on uh, Tahrir, and the journalist, a French journalist, came and told him, you're a Muslim Brother? And he said, no, I just, uh, I just pray, but that doesn't mean I'm a Muslim Brother. I'm, it's just like this, you know. 
So this uh, this this picture of uh, people of collective prayers on Tahrir was uh, well, it was sexy as um, for journalists to have this uh, this huge. It's a beautiful scene to see people like one body uh, bowing down. Or, so uh, it's a sexy picture to to put in the press, but. Uh, I think at the at the very beginning, the the regime was trying to um, use this to say, "Here, these are the Muslim brothers who are, who are behind the whole scene." Even even if even though they, they, they didn't they didn't call for <coughs> demonstrations this time for 25th of January and for the 6th of April in 2008, they were aloof from everything. So it was a, in in the Western countries in Western. Uh, media, it was seen as a uh, Islamic movement, but it was not. And in Egypt, it was only a question of uh, uh, collective, uh, I mean, Christians and Muslims hand in hands. You had the Masr al Yawm cover page with this, and Al Waft also, with uh, while people were praying, there were other peoples protecting them from the attacks from thugs. And this, you know, in the cops have a tattoo of the of the cross, and there was this guy was holding someone else guy, guy, and he was protecting Muslims praying while he was a Christian, and there was the visual element to to prove it. So within Egypt, it was used as a national unity uh, uh, item for for the revolution. I will stop here. Keep on informing. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Charles. And, uh, thank you for everyone for your participation. I think we're going to move to lunch. Uh, we don't want to hold you away from food. Uh, definitely, the session will have much for us to think about, and we're going to continue to think and write about it for a long time to come. Thank you.